Thing on. All right, that's great. Um, I, I laugh at the video because, uh, you know, Pastor Yang always like to say, wake up, wake up your idea. And then it's very like John MacArthur, you know, what's the matter with you people? Um, yeah. So I'm glad. Uh, welcome to the service today. Uh, if you came for our 10, 15 a.m. service, you would have heard about the mark of the beast and the prophet. Very serious stuff, you know. Today, we're not so serious. This one, a bit more gentle message. So that's good. Don't shock you into Cornerstone. You know, you, nice welcome. Maybe shock you later. Okay. So <laughs> uh, morning, everybody. It's a real joy and a privilege to be bringing the Word of God to you this morning. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about hospitality, and I'm going to be reframing uh, the way we do culture in Singapore, the, the t- cultural type of hospitality versus biblical hospitality. And I pray that um, we will be challenged by today's message, and let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Father God, we bless you. We bless your holy name. We thank you for your presence here. Lord, I just ask that Um, the meditations of my mind and my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you, O Lord. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you speak to your people today. Our ears are open, our hearts open to you, Lord. Do in us a work that changes the way we live. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, okay, great. So this morning, I'm going to be speaking about hospitality and our proof text, our uh, scripture reference for today comes from something that ought to be very familiar to many of us. Um, I'll give you a little story. I got, uh, I got beef with this parable, you know, because when I was young, there was like a storytelling competition in school and like I stood in front and I memorized this parable. But when I came to the Levite, you know, there's a priest, the Levite and the Samaritan, right? And the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. My brain got jammed. And <laughs> the word Levite wouldn't come out of my mouth. And so for like years after that, I despise this parable because of the emotional trauma that it caused. So this is the second time in my life that I'm like reading this parable over a stage or a pulpit. So I, I, I have it in front of me so that I won't jam at the word Levite today. Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, no jamming up. All right, the parable of the Good Samaritan, it comes from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Actually, if I had a teacher, I would very much like the teacher to be like Jesus. You know, there's actually a correct answer instead of like the questions being very passive-aggressive. Then you're scared to answer because you're scared to get it wrong. Yeah, but Jesus is very good. He says, yeah, correct. So (laughs) that's good. Now, verse 29, right? But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. So, three things that I'd like to begin with pointing out from this scripture today, right? Three core lessons, and then we'll build upon it. We'll build a house together today. The first one is, look where Jesus took this conversation about the nature of salvation and eternal life. Many of us think that the parable of the Good Samaritan is very much about um, doing nice things for people, being hospitable. But the context, the question that Jesus is actually asking, uh, answering is, teacher, teach me what I need to do to have eternal life. You see, Jesus ties the concept of charity into the concept of salvation. 
our salvation is linked to and is evidenced in our charity, right? Amen? Second point, look at how Jesus deals with the issue of identity. Many of us make claims about our Christianity. We wear our clerical collars or the robes of the priest or the Levite, right? There are these positions that we adopt, perhaps cell group leader. We are given titles, names, positions in the church. But Jesus, he's quite political in his answer, by the way, because he's talking to a bunch of Pharisees, scribes, lawyers, teachers of the law. And he frames the very religious leaders that he's speaking to as antagonists, the villains of the story. Whereas the Samaritan people themselves are actually cultural enemies of the Jews. And he's speaking to a Jewish audience, framing their cultural enemy as the protagonist in the story. Jesus don't do identity politics. Jesus broke past identity and he went to the works. He was focusing on the works and his core message was a political one. It was designed to poke them where it hurts. You think that you're righteous because of your position and your religious claims, the claims of faithfulness and and your knowledge of the scriptures. Let me tell you what's really important to me. It's the works. It's putting the man on your donkey. It's paying for his treatment. The third thing that I want to point out is that the lawyer was asking about who he should love to and what was his reason? It's because he was wanting to justify himself, right? That's what the scripture is saying. His focus was on his own salvation and him getting eternal life. But what does Jesus do? Jesus universalizes the claim. And he says, um, if you want to talk about charity, then let's not make it about self-preservation. Or rather, sorry, if you want to talk about eternal life, let's not make it about self-preservation. If you want to have eternal life, then you have to give yourself away. He takes the personal and he makes it public. He takes the the self-centricity and he moves it into a decentralized form. And so that's something that I hope that we can realize, right? Often when we do Christianity, when we do public life, there is this focus on privacy and kind of getting your own, making sure that you are saved. Jesus says, if you want to be saved, you give your life away to other people. So these are the three uh, lessons that I want to extract as a first blush. Now, when I think about hospitality and what the good Samaritan did, you know, he brought the man to the inn and he paid for the treatment, he took care of the guy. It sounds a lot like a hospital, doesn't it? I did a bit of research because I thought, you know, hospitality, hospital, I wonder if there's an etymological link between the two. And indeed, there is. So I discovered this paper and it's called The Evolution of the Hospital from Antiquity to the End of the Middle Ages. And uh, there is an abstract that I have there. I'm not going to read the abstract, but this is basically what it says. Healthcare was not universal until the Christians came along and made universal, well, not universal healthcare, but public health accessible to the public. Prior to that, it was just for political elite or military elite. But the Christians came along and said, no, we need to have a facility that can actually serve the public. And so praise the Lord because this is part of our commission. Hospitality is not only our commission, it is our legacy. Hospitals are our legacy as Christians. And so we really need to move past the cultural perspective of hospitality. Many of us think about hospitality as, okay, you know, I'm going to host cell group for my friends or I'm going to have a couple of people over, I'm going to entertain them over dinner, I'm going to provide them some nice roast pork or whatever it is, right? And then um, that's hospitality, la, great. La. And so we have our friends over and we have a nice chat around the dinner table about the high things of God and then we think we're good people. But perhaps there's something deeper. Perhaps the parable of the Good Samaritan is an allegory. I think it's an allegory that points us to meeting desperate needs of people who have been beaten up by the robbers of life. And I think that uh, those people who have been beaten up and stripped are an opportunity for us to be the Samaritan in this case. And so I want to suggest that hospitality can be understood in three tiers, right? The first tier of the house that, let, that let, I want us to build together is loving our friends. Hospitality as loving our friends as the first tier. The second tier is loving strangers. 
And the third tier is loving our enemies, all right? So let's start easy. Let's start uh, normal, okay? Um, low level of inconvenience, low level of sacrifice. Who are some of the hospitality managers of Cornerstone? They would probably be our cell group leaders or people who host cell groups, right? We serve the interests of the body of Christ. We make our homes available for ministry and we want to encourage this pattern of behavior. Let's be purposeful about meeting the needs of the ecclesia. But when we focus on the home, you know, perhaps Singaporeans like food, right? So let's focus on the dinner table, lah, huh? okay? I am now in a place where I'm designing my own home, right? Uh, in fact, right after today's sermon, I'm going to rush home, uh, have a quick lunch with my fiancé, and then we are going to the new home for the very first time to uh, have some contractors over to take a look at the, the development of the space and whether it can meet our budget or not, lah, okay? This is an actual picture of the home that I hope to have. So we bought a slightly larger home because we wanted to use it for the purposes of ministry. I've been talking to my fiancé about how when we design the home, I want to design it with cell group in mind, but also cannot be ugly, lah, must be a bit chante, you know? Just in case God calls us out to go and be missionaries or something, I need to be able to like monetize the home and like rent it out, so it must look a bit nice, lah, okay? So that, <laughs> that's the logic with which I'm approaching the building of my home. But when some people heard, you know, very well-meaning friends, very well-meaning, very in the Singaporean culture of things, they say, hey, you, 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 are, you keep talking about other people, other people, but your home is for you. Your home is for your interests, your family. You need to uh, shut out all your, like, this ministry, goody-two-shoes nonsense and just build a comfortable place for you, your wife, and your future children. And I say, oh, yeah, 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 that makes sense. Huh? You know, I cannot, like, subjugate the interests of my wife to the interests of ministry. And then it somehow it just didn't sit right in my heart, you know? I began to think, wait, hang on. If my home is for me and my life is for people, then the home should reflect what I want to do with it, right? And so there really is nothing wrong in designing my home with a focus on serving the community and serving other people. So we have like a nice little big like living room kind of thing, and then we have a nice dinner table. Hey, my table can put 10 people there, you know? So I can have like my whole cell group around the dinner table. That's good, praise the Lord. My cell group leader actually gave me that table. So yeah, I'm really grateful for that. Now, they say that when you wanna know what's truly like important to a person, you look at their calendar, and you look at their wallet or their bank account, right? Because where a person spends their time and where a person spends their money are often reflections of what's important to them. I'd like to suggest, you know, from my own like, life experience right now that I think how a person designs their home is also a reflection of their the theology. And so we must uh, consider... Uh, every aspect of our lives and how we can align it with the purposes of the gospel. My very first message here at Cornerstone was the gospel of the kingdom where I talked about, you know, our salvation is not just for us to happy sindiri go to heaven. It's about um, serving other people and making sure that the kingdom on earth has an on-ramp for its expansion. May our homes be used as an expansion on-ramp for the kingdom. Amen. But I think we need to go beyond that. The places that we bought our homes, the streets, the blocks that we live in are chosen by the Lord, not just by us. And the neighbours that have been appointed to us are our parish. Sometimes for our neighbours in Singapore, Singaporean Christians, by the way, in combination with the Catholics, represent only 20% of the country. Eh? The, 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 the fact that our neighbours are our neighbours is for many of them the closest that they will get to church. Perhaps we could make our homes church for them and our families representative of how Christians are. So how our children treat us with respect, how we treat our wives and how we love and respect our husbands, that is reflective of how church is and that is the on-ramp that they have. But let's expand beyond uh, our immediate neighbours and community, uh, just beyond the cell group. What else can we do? Who are the friends that we can look out for? Let me read from Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, right? Um, Let's not grow weary in well-doing, for in good time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to everyone, and especially from the family of faith. 
There are plenty of people within Cornerstone itself who are like expats. Um, even Bob, you know, who leads worship, he's not Singaporean, by the way. He's Indian, you know. Yeah, he doesn't look like Indian, but he's actually from India. And uh, Bob is exemplary in this regard. You know, Bob is a foreigner living in our land. He basically has dinner parties like every night of the week for people, you know, okay, I'm exaggerating, but he has people over to his house very, very often. He cooks for them, he shows them a good time, he builds community that way. But I'll tell you a secret. The secret is that Bob doesn't get invited to anybody else's house. So Bob is busy being hospitable to the whole world, right? And he's bringing in that culture from where he comes from, that community centricity, but as Singaporeans, it's just somehow not really in our DNA because our personal space is our personal space or it's for people that we are very comfortable with, that we've established safety with outside and then we invite them to our homes. But I wonder if there's any way that we can stretch this principle and be a bit more vulnerable with our private spaces. You know, there are plenty of Malaysians who will now be going home because the land links are open. And I wonder if we've missed our opportunity for hospitality while our Malaysian brothers and sisters within the household of faith were kind of trapped in Singapore and we had that opportunity to be that family to them. But then now, I don't know, is the window closing or is there a way to redeem this? Just a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. There are also hidden groups within the church and I really, really want to stress this, right? Um, there are believers who have left other faiths and the consequence of leaving these other faiths is that they lose their families, they lose their inheritance. My own fiancé has left another faith and basically by law, she loses her inheritance, there are people who, uh, fortunately, you know, her family is somewhat understanding and they haven't like cut her off and, yeah. There are background, there are believers from other backgrounds that need community because they've lost everything for the sake of Christ. Amen? There are Christians with same-sex attraction who, because of their same-sex attraction, they cannot get married. There are many who do. There are many who do because they find a way to reconcile it and they are very happy in their marriages. I have many such friends. But there are those that will choose the path of holy celibacy, fullness in Christ, but they need community too. So while we have the opportunity to have husbands and wives and children, many of these will be voluntarily celibate and don't have that immediate nucleus of family can we perhaps remember these as well, right? The third one is mums with unsupported pregnancies or single mums. Now, within the church, we, of course, we encourage nuclear families, but the fact is that bad things happen to good people, people make silly mistakes, whatever. There's a whole spectrum of things, right? If the church wants to stand against atrocities like abortion, we need to be a part of the solution as well. And part of that solution is building a culture where we are actively looking out, just as the Samaritan did. He came and he saw the man. Do we see the invisible ones amongst us who need that community? Another one is widows and widowers who have lost their closest partner in life and they're now alone, right? Can the church rally and be that community of support? Amen? So, Psalms 68 verse 6, it says, God sets the lonely in families. He lets out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. So, let's remember that the Lord wants to set the lonely in our families. Now, let's move on to the second tier of the house. Let's move to a higher level of sacrifice and inconvenience. Amen? Let's refer back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan took pity on him. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, how do we feel? Do we feel pity, sympathy, compassion for those who have been ambushed by the robbers of life and left half dead, needing resuscitation? Do, do we go to them? Because the Good Samaritan went to him. He saw him, he took pity, and he went to him. Who are we going to? The Good Samaritan bandaged his wounds, Right? Are we being a healing solution to people who have been beat up, beaten up in life? The Good Samaritan put the man on his own donkey. Now, that might seem like an innocuous thing, right? Just get in the car, lah, bro. I'll bring you to your destination. Except, donkey, this time, only sit one people, okay? Number two, the distance between Jerusalem to Jericho ah, 
is 29 kilometers, 18 miles. That's a long distance for you to walk when you could have been riding your donkey while the person that you're ferrying is on your only mode of transportation. So let's remember that there is the component of sacrifice, sacrificial giving, amen? It's going to inconvenience us, but I think we ought to be inconvenienced for the cause of Christ because charity has to cost something and look like something. All right, he brought the man to an inn and he paid for it, right? He paid for the treatment. Do we spend of our own resources? And finally, he took care of him. Do we outsource our charity as soon as we see an opportunity for ministry? Do we pay our tithe and give our offering and then expect the church to handle every problem? Or is the fact that God shows us the challenge of uh, the community around us an indication to us that we ought to directly get involved with the problems that we see? Remember that this is an issue of salvation and of eternal life, my friends. And this is how Jesus tied in the parable into the original question of, Master, tell me about how I can achieve eternal life or be secure in my eternal life. Let's go to etymology. You know, I'm a Methodist by background and our Methodist preachers, they really love to go into the Greek. Uh, and so come, let's go into the Greek together. <laughs> so we think hospitality is about convenient dinner table entertainment, right? You know, when your friends come to Singapore, you show them around, that's hospitality. But the Greek term is actually a compound word, right? It's philosinosh, okay? Uh, a compound word referring to uh, philo, uh, brotherly love, love for your brother, and Xenos, Xenos is a stranger or a foreigner. When you put it together, the actual uh, richness of the word is not simply entertainment or convenience, but rather to love a stranger as if he were your brother. And that involves a certain degree of commitment and involvement, amen? And so we want to make sure that we can um, do the same, live up to the biblical credo of what hospitality ought to be, rather than the Singaporean cultural convention. And so I've got a quick list of people that I wanted us to consider uh, the strangers in our lives, right? Because previously, I spoke about easy, easy ones, people that we already know, people from our household of faith. But what about people that we're unfamiliar with? This is where it gets dicey for Singaporeans because we have a very low threshold for uncertainty, right? So what about visiting missionaries? Kind of safe, right? I mean, you come to Singapore, yeah, 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 right. You know, the church knows you. They come for kingdom vision. Just put them out for a few days. Do we have that spare capacity? Let's go a bit deeper. What about colleagues who are expat workers or foreign students? You won't believe huh, how unbelievably lonely it is for foreign students. You know, I've, been to, I've lived in a couple of different countries uh, over my few years on the earth. Um, uh, I've lived in Wales, I've lived in Africa, I've lived in Australia. And there is this cultural dissonance that you have with the people. You never fully understand them and they definitely never fully understand you. And that process of not really being understood can be ameliorated if only you were adopted into an Australian family that took you in as their own. And even if there is that understanding that, okay, I never fully get you and you never fully get me, you know that you belong and you know that there's somebody there to look out for you. So these groups of people, right, they really need that and I think that there's an opportunity for the church to rise to the occasion. There's also, okay, so in Singapore, right, we have quite a different group, uh, a lot of different migrants, if you will. Uh, there are foreign workers, the, the ones that earn like 5,000 and above, and then there's the class that earns 8,000, uh, sorry, 800, 800. In Cornerstone, we have a Telugu service, right? And we have some Cornerstonians that go and get actively involved with the migrant worker community. But somehow, because, you know, many of us earn at a certain level, we feel that like, ah, we cannot really communicate. And so, ah, namala, maybe somebody else will do it. Why don't we get involved? Why do we, I mean, not to be too harsh, lah, okay? But we kind of discriminate financially because we feel that we're not really able to connect and then we use that as an excuse to say, perhaps somebody else will do it. Maybe that's Pastor Nelson's territory. Maybe that's Pastor Nelson's responsibility. It's not. Hospitality is about breaking boundaries and reaching out to strangers that are unfamiliar to us to give them that sense of belonging so that they can understand the love of Christ in our case, in our context, right? What about... Let's go even more involved. Because so far, I've been quite convenient. Stay a little while, you know, maybe have over dinner people, unfamiliar people. 
uh, for, uh, yeah, okay. What about fostering and adoption? A, li- a lot more involved, you know, a lot more long-term. And somehow when it comes to fostering, perhaps, the reason why certain children are in the foster care system is because they didn't come from a family that was stable and able to impart good values, patterns of behaviour, so on and so forth. So they already come into your family with a degree of, uh, what's the word for it? Like, uh, not to be ungentle, but like problematization that we need to cope with and and deal with and provide a safe environment for people to become whole and well-adjusted individuals. But that will come at a cost to my rest time, my community, my private community, if my wife and my kids, uh, th- there may be a conflict among the siblings. Are we willing to embrace the messiness that hospitality requires of us? I think some of us are quite messy averse, you know. Uh, I am very messy averse, but there is this conviction in my heart that if I'm really going to live out the gospel, then there has to be a price that needs to be paid. And so this is one of those components that I can pay that price with. Let me tell you a quick story. Last year, National Day Rally, there was Prime Minister Lee commending a girl named Roslina Tan. Roslina Tan uh, was basically, during the pandemic when everything shut down, she led a band of 200 volunteers to go and find homeless people, rough sleepers, MRT la, void deck la, in the Woodlands area, UT area, and they went to go and put them in like homes, right? And so Prime Minister Lee said, wow, this is the kind of Singaporean that we want to have. We're so proud of girls like Roslina. Wow, uh, that's very good. What many people don't know is that Roslina herself was homeless at one stage. And so we know this within the church, and we also know that she was adopted by a pastor named Ian Toh from 316 Church. And she was given that stable platform, that opportunity to become a whole individual who was able to serve her community because she too was given that opportunity by somebody else, this time a Christian who extended hospitality to a girl from a very problematic background And he introduced her to his family, he integrated her, and that's where she grew and she flourished. I've had that opportunity with my own cell group leaders as well, you know, when they took care of me when I was much younger. So I think it would be beautiful if we could do that as well for the community. And also for the homeless people of Singapore. These people have become bankrupt, not financially, but relationally bankrupt. So may we never see people as projects or problems to be solved. May we see them as persons to be loved. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 to 3 says, Continue in brotherly love. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were bound with them and those who are mistreated as if you were suffering with them. Let's remember the children. You know that video about the children? Jesus says, let the little children come to me. They come to him by us first going to them. And it's the same for prisoners. Prisoners are trapped in the prisons, right? But if we go to them, we represent the hands and feet of Jesus who are doing so. Let me read on. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 to 8. Is this not the kind of fasting that I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide for the poor, the wanderer with a shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. And then get this. You see the consequence. When you do all of this, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will appear quickly. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Our fast is practicing justice and charity. And that is directly related to the spiritual fruit that it brings. In this case, your light breaking forth and your healing coming. So may we also look for the strangers in our midst. Amen? Amen, brothers and sisters? Amen? Yes, amen. Okay, give me something, some energy. All right. Okay, very good. Praise the Lord. <laughs> all right, let's, let's, let's wrap this up um, by focusing on the last category of people, loving our enemies. Ooh, tricky, right? I've struggled with this concept for quite a long time because my understanding of things is that Christians shouldn't have enemies. And so at the dinner table yesterday, I asked around, I asked my fiance, I said, do Christians have enemies? And she said, yeah, there's always people you don't like what? I'm like, okay, but are they your enemies? You know? 
uh, if there are people that have hurt you, our responsibility is to forgive, is it not? Because not unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping that your enemy will die. But actually, uh, no lah, right? We, we get freedom in our forgiveness. But as loving as Christians ought to be, we do subscribe to a particular worldview. There is a perspective on morality that has do's and don'ts. And a culture that wants to validate and amplify the don'ts of Christianity will see Christians and Christianity as the enemy. There are people with inbuilt skepticism, maybe even hurt from Christians, past experiences, or what they think they have heard, or what they think they know about. No naming names, lah. we all know what I'm talking about. Are there people like that in our own lives that we can show hospitality to? Not because we see them as the enemy, but perhaps they see us as the enemy and they need an invitation to start melting the ice. They need an invitation to start deconstructing those paradigms of fear, of prejudice, whatnot. So I pray, brothers and sisters, that we too will go beyond our comfort zones, our immediate family church, into the realm of strangers, where there is no necessary animosity, there could be inconvenience and struggle, but also moving further into the realm of the enemy, to be that light in a dark place, in the dark place of the soul. Because people don't come to Christ but through the gospel being preached, and often the gospel is preached without words. Yeah, so I pray that we just recall that. Let me read a couple of scriptures and then I'll close. Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 36. Jesus says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Verse 33. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. And then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. I hope that we can see that, right? It's this idea of Him being kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. It's through us, the hands and feet of Christ. We are the kindness of God that is expressed to an undeserving world for whom the Saviour has died. The Saviour longs that all men will be reconciled unto Him. And we are the vehicle of reconciliation. That's why we carry with us the ministry of reconciliation. Amen? I hope that I tie these concepts together in a way that makes sense to us in a practical way, that we can act on the gospel and not just be hearers of the gospel. You know, Matthew 5.44, he says, But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. My brothers and sisters, let us never neglect the power in prayer. We often try to take things into our own hands and we do so over kind words and a dinner table meal. But it's not undergirded by the practice of prayer that breaks the spiritual strongholds before they even show up. And when we do this, when we pray for those that persecute you, what does it say in verse 45? It says, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Our identity as ambassadors of Christ, children of God, is shown, is demonstrated in our hospitality and charity. And so, in Singapore, we're great. We give money, we give gifts. May we extend that into realms that we are uncomfortable with. Time, private space, levels of inconvenience, levels of messiness that we are willing to embrace for the sake of the gospel. We're willing to have our lives disrupted, our little pristine snow globes, if you will, you know. We did a play a couple of years ago, about five years ago, about the snow globe. Then it's about a pristine, untouched life in Singapore. But the compassion of Christ will require us to disrupt our snow globes as well. So let's make room, brothers and sisters. Amen. Let's just sit in our hearts and ask the Lord, Father, 
who would you like me to minister to? Which group do you want me to, to speak to, reach out to? And again, no pressure. There's no pressure in this because we're just supposed to do the things that God tells us to do. I've mentioned so many groups today, foreigners to single moms. We're not supposed to save the world, brothers and sisters. We're just supposed to reach out to the ones that Christ highlights to us. So who is He showing us, the Samaritans? Who is God highlighting to us? Amen. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me. Let's serve Christ that way. Amen. Will you rise as I pray for us today and then we'll close the service. turn away from self-preservation and we ask Lord that you deconstruct the Singaporean culture of hospitality in our minds and you lead us towards kingdom culture oh God Lord I pray Lord for there to be such an infilling of willingness of love that we will give out of the uh, the inflow that you have put in our hearts give out of the richness of the kingdom in our hearts Father I just ask for the grace of God to be upon the people today oh Lord that indeed, Lord, we will not give out of a matter of trying to prove our goodness, but just out of the overflow of what you have done in our lives, O oh Lord. Father, I pray that the church will be a testimony of your grace, your hospitality, your love, your warmth, your acceptance in a cold, dark, inhospitable world, O oh Lord. Father, I pray that Christians will be that light on the hill. Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray that you help us see what you see. Give us hearts to feel what you feel. Give us hands to do what your hands do. And give us feet, O oh God, to go where you are already. Lord, what do you want me to do? What is your heart? Help me to see what you see and to feel what you feel. And we pray this in the mighty and the precious name of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, that's the message for today, my brothers and sisters. May we go into the world and make that difference for Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed. Go in the power of the Lord.